Good morning, Central. I have a quick question for you. Has, I'm waiting for my slides to come up. It might take a little bit. Has anybody ever been to India? Okay, let me tell you about India. They venerate cows. They don't worship them. They venerate them. They will let them roam freely in the streets. Now, I've driven through Missouri before. I'm not from Missouri, but I was smart enough to marry someone who was from Missouri, okay? <laughs> so I, I have driven through the cattle paths, the little winding roads, and what happens when a fence falls down, gets knocked over, and the cattle just... There, it's a normal occurrence. They walk through the streets. They block traffic. They, they lay down in the middle of the road. And you're expected to drive around them, to never disturb them. In fact, you can go put a lay on them or give them a big hug. And not only that, it's chapel time. I don't want to bring this up. But what do cows do also naturally as they just walk? And so this is all over the place. And not to mention, in India, what is one of the number one problems India faces? Starvation. It's yummy, okay? <laughs> Please. You just won't do anything with it. And we sit there and we go, oh, silly Hindus. There's a lot of hamburger there. And here's the problem. How Hindu is your church? How many sacred cows... Block the way. Stop your progress. Lay down and refuse to move. We've reached a decision, but Miss So-and-so would be offended. So we dare not do it. And so what do we do? We venerate them. We put their names on plaques. We, we put ceremonial lace. Oh, we would never want to cause a stir to achieve God's work. We'd much rather venerate you and your likes and dislikes. And we're really sorry for the linoleum change in the kitchen that was 80 years old. Now, by the way, if you go, Jim, the church has sacred cows? Yes. Here's a couple of them. Number one, the building. I have seen churches split over what to do with the physical property. I was actually at a church on the staff. An individual passed away, gave the church $50,000. Finally, we could renovate our sanctuary, our worship center. And we talked about all the wonderful changes we could do. And we said we could take out the back wall and finally put in a beautiful baptistry. And all of a sudden, when this church was built, my great-grandfather put in that wall one of the blocks, one of the bricks, a big stone. You're not tearing that down. Okay, okay, maybe we can build around it. You're not touching that drywall because my uncle put that drywall up 60 years ago. Well, well, maybe we can just expand out this way. My aunt bought the playground that's outside those doors. We had to give the $50,000 back. By the way, the attendance plummeted, of course, because we were running out of room. But at least we preserved the building. By the way, leadership structures. How leadership functions in the church. Do you use a board structure? Where elders and deacons meet together and vote? Because we're members of the restoration movement. I think I can say this safely. That's not in the Bible. Nowhere. And sometimes, and by the way, God can work through any leadership structure, okay? He's more powerful than us. But sometimes we just don't need to set up another what? Sacred cow to block and impede the progress. By the way, there's something else, style of worship. Well, we know. We know that we're righteous and faithful because we haven't changed the same thing since 1927. That's right. You know, we talked about a little bit ago, sometimes you have to go, 
you know, okay, who are you really inviting with the style of worship you have? Now, how many of you like to go fishing? I actually like to go fishing. And if you put bait on your pole and you cast and you sit there and nothing's hitting it, what do you do? Oh, no, you don't change bait. You tell the fish it's their fault they're not biting it. <laughs> because this is the bait we've always used. And I like the bait. And it's the same bait my dad used and my, my dad before him. That's it. No, you change the bait. I like Western. Louis L'Amour. He had a simple statement. When your horse dies, dismount. <laughs> Don't keep riding the dead horse. <laughs> By the way, another, another one is, is dominant voice. Is there an individual in the church that seems to have a trump card? The whole, with the elders have met, we've discussed it, we've decided to do this. I don't think so. Oh, we, yes, we weren't thinking at all. No, we forgot to come and get your permission. Okay. By the way, this is a big one, bylaws. Now, I would bring this up here, but I didn't give you all three months notice of a two-thirds majority vote required for me to talk about bylaws in public. <laughs> that had to be announced at least in four services. You get the picture. By the way, I actually was serving at a church that drew up its bylaws during the time of a church split. And not just a church split, a three-way split. You may want to guess how long the bylaws were. But I came there after the split. So I walked in all happy, not knowing what had just happened. And you know, give me a number. 20 higher. 60 higher. Higher. 200 higher. 361. They brought me a, a, a three ring, five inch notebook that said, This is kind of the peace treaty. So if the light bulb burns out, you literally have to go to the board with it on the agenda and a two thirds majority vote to determine who's allowed to change it. Yeah, this is helpful to advancing the kingdom of God. I remember reading that in the book of First Opinions. Um, <laughs> not to mention this ministry arrangement. You know, I, I understand there has to be lines of authority and lines of communication, but have you ever stepped back and went, what kind of ministries are we doing and what group are they ministering to and how effective are they actually working and is there something we're missing? Now here's the point. The church has a vision and mission. It has a purpose. But what these sacred cows do is what? They just get in the way. They just block the vision and mission to the point that when you look at the elder's agenda or a leadership agenda, instead of talking about the vision and mission of the church, you're talking about what? Everything else. And the politics of trying to get around it. Now, by the way, I'm not talking about just paying no attention to important things. But I'm also saying if we're really serious about fulfilling the mission that God gave the church, we're going to have to be able to stand up to people who say, no, as a matter of fact, I have something more important. And it's usually my agenda. No. No well, then I'll quit and take my $5 tithe check elsewhere. <laughs> and we'll help you find another church. Ooh, can't say that. Okay. <laughs> now, by the way, this is something that happens in the Bible. Jesus versus the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 15. He asked them, you know, why are you breaking the traditions of the... They're asking, why are you breaking the traditions of the elders? Jesus had to be willing to say, you know what? There's what God wants, and then there's what we've set up human traditions. And we have to do what? Be willing to break from those human traditions when they run contrary to what God wants us to do. By the way, Jesus and his disciples, and Peter said to Jesus, by the way, this is at the, the Mount of Transfiguration. They're on the way to Jerusalem. They know Jesus is going to set up himself to die, to give a sacrifice. They get there. 
uh, Peter, you know, let's get the Peter, James, and John, let's come over here. And then Elijah and Moses show up. And Peter goes, hey, I got a great idea. Let's not go to Jerusalem. It's pretty sweet right here. Let's just set up some tents and kind of just camp out here. Wouldn't it be great just to huddle here at the mountain and stay here instead of going to Jerusalem? And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, is it good that we are here? Let us make tents, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Jesus said to do what? No. We're having a great time, but that's not what we're here for. We have to go where? Jerusalem. By the way, we see it again. Acts chapter 6, 1 through 7. If you want to read this or read it in your Bible, it's great. But what it says is the number of disciples is increasing rapidly. The church in Jerusalem is growing. But as it's growing, the same 12 people are doing everything. If there was an organizational chart to the church of Jerusalem, it said apostles in every little box. Okay, certain groups start not getting taken care of, and they begin to grumble. The apostles learn of it. And we can tell they must have huddled because it says it seemed best to us, meaning they must have discussed some options. But look what they say, you know, it's, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. So you all pick from among you seven men, we give qualifications, and we will appoint them to take care of that ministry, and that will enable us to keep doing what Jesus told us to do. They changed their methodology. And not only that, but I want us to hear the real message of this. I meet so many churches. I do church coaching. I meet so many churches who go, we're very faithful. We haven't changed anything from the day we started. You know what this says? If you're going to be faithful to God, change is what you have to do. Because here, if they said, nope, we're going to keep doing it the same way we've always done it, then we're not going to preach the word of God. We're not going to fulfill what Jesus has us to do. In order to preach the word of God, in order to advance the kingdom and to fulfill the mission Jesus gave, they had to change. They had to. It wasn't an option. Later in Acts chapter 15, they're debating whether Gentiles can enter the church. Do they have to become Jewish first? Do they have to accept our heritage, our faith, before the Gentiles can be entered into the kingdom? James, who's an elder, by the way, replied, Brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, as it is written. And then he quotes the prophet Amos. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God. James is Jewish. He is a Jewish Christian. He was raised Jewish. And he is now having to set aside his own heritage to say that Gentiles can come to Jesus just like everybody else. They don't have to look or be or eat or drink or think like we did in our culture. They can come to Jesus. Now, what do all these examples have in common? Well, first off, they had to determine what was biblical as opposed to what was traditional. If it's biblical, we have to do it. But if it's traditional, it's optional. By the way, they had to prioritize long-term mission over the short-term experience. They also had to do this. They had to hold on to what was missional as opposed to what was methodological. Not to mention, they had to elevate the mission of Christ even above the values of their heritage. That's how Jesus' mission succeeded. He didn't let the sacred cows get in the way. That's how the early church succeeded. They didn't allow sacred cows to what? Block the mission. So how did the sacred cows get set up in the first place? Where did they even come from? Let me give a couple of ideas where sacred cows come from. First off, it could be a desire for peace and harmony. Well, we don't want to ruffle too many feathers. We don't want to cause too many problems. 
After all, the mission of the church is that we're all happy with each other, right? That's what Jesus called us to. No. By the way, it could be that we have a concrete mind. When I was a kid, I used to love concrete trucks because they did what? Yeah. I even had a little matchbox car, you know, move it and make a little drum spin. What happens when that drum stops spinning? It sets up. I've had people who work in construction tell me that when one of those actually stops, they debate whether to chip it all out or just throw the drum away because it is so hard to get it out once it's solidified in there. Here's my point. What happens when a mind stops learning? What happens when a mind stops thinking, starts looking, starts, stops searching? It just becomes concrete. By the way, when we mistake management for leadership, see, management takes care of what's here and now. Leadership is looking where? What's next? The future. By the way, sacred cows are also set up by listening to wrong voices, taking wrong votes, and asking wrong questions. Or when we place heritage and tradition over the vision mission of the church. Not to mention when we have embedded routines. Embedded routines. We just do things the same way because that's the way we've always done them before. We haven't thought about it in so long. We don't know how to think differently about it. And so now everything has to be done the same. So how do you do this? What happens? Well, we need to foster innovation to break down the sacred cows. If that is blocking the road, we need some way to get rid of it and turn it into what? <laughs> and I know it's just before lunch, okay? So I do apologize, but those do look good. Okay, so how do you do this? Well, I want to give you an idea. First off, you can spark innovation by identifying a need. We're going to talk about each one of these. But once you've identified a need, you have to figure out a solid engagement of it. How do we really tackle that need? And then, group by group, individual by individual, you have to get congregational buy-in. Okay? Now, there's, there's two ways of doing this. There's a caveat. The first way is management. If you have a management mentality, you're going to focus on an existing problem or a problem in the past. What direction are you facing? Backward. Okay? So we're going to be innovative about fixing something that's already a problem. And so we need to respond to an existing need. And what do we do? Well, we go to the congregation asking for approval or affirmation of the plan. That's all we're asking for because the problem's already there. It's already self-evident. We think we have a solution. Will you simply give us permission to implement it? And the thing is, even if they give you permission, there is very little cultural change in the body. Because they can still remain typically passive. But you see, leadership does something different. It targets, or anticipa it targets an anticipated need. It's a future focus. Look at the horizon. What is something coming over the horizon that we need to step up to the plate and be ready for? Can I give a little quick illustration? I talk to several churches. I love it when I hear this. Well, we would hire a youth minister once we have kids in the church. Why would they come to your church if you don't have a youth ministry? Oh, okay. Yeah. But what are you doing to reach out to like the millennial generation? Well, we don't have any near our church. Yeah, that's my point. What are you doing to reach out <laughs> to the millennial generation? Well, we're just going to have an extra worship service a little later in the day. Same stuff we did at the earlier one. You see what I'm getting at? <laughs> so you try to anticipate a future need. It's not even evident yet. It's not even evident yet. I call it the Amos factor because in the Old Testament, Amos makes all these 
pronouncements against the foreign, foreign nations around him. And then finally, he talks about his own country. But at the time, all those nations were powerful and strong. What do you mean they're going to fall? They're not going to fall. They're, they're bigger and stronger than we are. But he could see something where? On the horizon. We need to be facing forward and look at anticipated needs and then say, we have an opportunity. There's a new subdivision being planned over here. It's going to start in about a year. What are we going to have when 200 new people move right next to our church? Well, should we just wait till it gets built and the people start showing up? No. We're going to anticipate the opportunity. We're going to design intentional engagement. And by the way, we're not just going to ask for approval. We're going to start engaging people in our church to get ready for this. We want them not just simply to buy in in verbiage, but actually to get involved in the planning process for this. And then you have tangible, tremendous cultural change in your church because now it's not just 20% of the people doing 80% of the work. But you've given them a reason for doing it. So how do you see the needs? Well, a couple of things. First off, acknowledge real problems. Jim Collins uh, wrote a book called Good to Great, and he said the first thing you have to do is face the brutal facts. Face the brutal facts. I do church coaching. Uh, I went to a church to coach them. I said, I'd just like to see your attendances and your financials over the last three years. They said, well, you know, things haven't been good. I said, I understand that. Yeah, so we stopped taking attendance and keeping financials. It's like a friend of mine in Bible college. He, he admitted at a floor devotion he had a real problem with speeding. And it was really bearing down on him because it's, it's wrong to do that. So I got in the car to go pick up a pizza with him one day. I looked over and his speedometer was off. He broke the needle right off. And he said, I said, you don't have a needle. Yeah, now I don't know I'm speeding. <laughs> that doesn't help, Okay. That doesn't help. This is my point. Brutally face the facts. Realize, you know, a big problem may be a big opportunity. You know, secondly, re reassert the vision and the mission. Preach about it. Teach about it. Have small group dialogue about it. Build that in your congregation. Let them understand this is what we're going to do. That the kingdom of God isn't about all these other things that preoccupy us. And by the way, look beyond the walls. Sometimes church identifies itself as the people sitting in the pew. Got it. But that's not where the mission field is. It's where? Beyond the walls. And we can easily forget that. And so we become content and member-driven because we're happy with who's already here instead of asking, who do we need to reach? And not only that, but have a look beyond this Sunday. Just don't go, well, we're planning for next Sunday. Well, how about planning for a month out or a year out or developing a three-year plan for your church of where it should be and what the initiative should be to get it there? Look beyond whatever limit you've already placed. Now, by the way, okay, so Jim, we see the needs. How do we find solutions, though? Where do we go? Well, first off, listen to participants. I've found that in some churches, you sit down, you talk to the people who are actually engaged in the ministry, they know exactly what would help them because they're the ones doing it. By the way, visit other congregations. When you're on vacation, ask someone, hey, I'm going to be in, fill in the blank, what church should I visit to see how they do things? And then take notes. Go up to their welcome desk grab literature, go grazing. Anything they have to pick up, pick it up. Just don't pick up a handful of pens, okay? Um, <laughs> I get in trouble with the North American for that. Okay, um, but engage networks. You're not in this alone. You're not in this alone. We are all on the same team. Not to mention the fact, read a lot. Don't let that concrete mind set up. You know, bring in a coach or a consultant, someone with fresh eyes who hasn't been there before, who's going to raise the question, well, why doesn't this happen? By the way, I actually did this 
a church had me come in and do a consult. Before I went, I got a couple of friends of mine, <laughs> some former students. I said, could you just go visit that church? Cold, don't tell them you're coming. Don't tell them you're with me. Just show up and then call me and let me know how it went. They walked in the door, child in hand, and a lady walked up and said, who are you? What are you doing here? You don't attend this church. They called me because they were having trouble wondering why people don't come back to church after they visit. That was all much. Her, right there, that's it. This is my point. So, you know, once again, listening to someone who's experiencing it for the first time. But attend a conference. Congratulations. <laughs> but intentionally break your routine. Now, by the way, I know it's not easy. I serve at a church where we pass the communion trays. And one Sunday, our worship director said, there are tables set up around the back of the church. As we're singing, you can stand up, go to the table, get the elements, take it, and come back and sit down. What? We've never done it that way before. Yes, correct. <laughs> Very good. And we're going to change up how we do things so that the church doesn't do what? Become concrete. It's intentional. And by the way, when you're doing a plan, erase the board. Well, Jim, yes, we're going to talk about how we do discipleship. Here's our board. Now, before you even start, we already have this, 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 this. Now, you're free to do whatever you need to do. You just put seven sacred cows on the board that I have to basically maneuver around to get anything done. If you really want to improve our ministry, those don't get an automatic buy. What do you do? You erase the board and say, now what do we need to do? Some of the things to be reincorporated, some can be changed. Some may have to be what? Eliminated. So how do you get buy-in? Okay, first off, focus on the need. This is important. This is crucial. This is what we're trying to achieve. Focus. By the way, uh, couch everything in vision and mission with scriptural examples, scriptural support, scriptural uh, rationale. Set a wig. I know, okay. Um, but set a wig, a wildly important goal. By wildly important, let me give an illustration. 1957, NASA had 17 objectives. 17 different groups in NASA vying for people, for resources, for money, for lab space, for technology, you name it. 17 different groups clamoring for the resources. Until 1962, when at Rice University, Kennedy, President Kennedy stood up and said what? We are going to the moon in this decade. Not because it's easy, but because it's hard. Now, how many objectives does NASA have? And everything had to be, be assessed. Does that help us get to the moon or not? And by the way, nine years later, we landed. Actually, eight years later, we landed. Present an attainable path. An attainable path. Keep it under five phases or five steps. Don't go, this is easily achieved in 96 steps. <laughs> that would panic anybody. <laughs> Perpetual motion forward. Always give an update. Always expect forward momentum. Always keep people informed. This is what has to happen next. This is where we are in the journey. And by the way, rally your champions. I served at a church where I uh, had a fairly new executive team, and we were making some pretty big changes. Some people in the church, particularly older people, were having some difficulty with it. So guess what we did? We would go over to the nursing home, to the former pastor, 
we would sit there with him and go, Bob, here's what we want to do. We really need your help. Okay, I can help you. So on Sunday morning, we'd get him dressed. We'd literally wheel him up, help him stand, 92 years old. People would be applauding. And he would basically say, now the idea these guys have is a good idea. And remember when we were young and we had wild ideas that we didn't get a lot of support for? Well, now they're the young ones and they need our support. Thank you very much. Then we'd get him off stage and get him back to. <laughs> we rallied our champions. We got the people who could influence others and gave them the microphone. That's how you get buy-in. But in this whole thing, this whole process, I have one major piece of advice. Stay flexible. <laughs> if you were to come and visit my office in, in uh, Fayetteville, Georgia, I have a long meeting table. I hear all kinds of ideas, all kinds of challenges to ideas. But at the end of the table, up on a bookshelf, are Gumby and Pokey. So that I'm sitting there leading the meeting, I remind myself to do what? Stay flexible. Somebody else may have a better idea. They may have caught something I missed. Stay flexible. By the way, if you're going, I want to hear more about innovation. Here's a couple of resources. Innovation's Dirty Little Secret, The Four Disciplines of Execution, and Harvard Business Review's uh, must reads on innovation. But above all, I'd like you to lead well. Thank you.